Watch this. Surprise! Not everybody loves them, especially when it comes to charges on your medical bills. Idaho lawmakers are looking to eliminate future sticker shock. Teachers talking about the birds and the bees. Unless you don't want them to. Or maybe only if you do want them to. Opting out may soon not be parents' only option. More than 75 years ago, he was fighting a bloody battle for possession of a Pacific island. He never thought he'd ever go back, but he's glad he did. Oh, do you like surprises? Probably depends on what it is, right? Birthday cake, cool. Long lost relative, nice. How about a surprise medical bill? Probably not a fan. Well, neither is Majority Caucus Chair and Representative Megan, Megan, excuse me, Blanksma. She drafted a bill to end surprise medical billing here in Idaho. So what exactly does that cover? Joe Paris explains. I just think that we've ignored it for so long. We need to do something. That it Representative Megan Blanksma is talking about? Shortness of breath. Surprise medical bills. Those are the bills you get after you went to an in-network facility, only to find out later that you were actually treated by an out-of-network physician. Medic 1-5, medical 1 minute. Most times, that comes with a much higher bill. And Representative Blanksma says she has seen enough of surprise billing in Idaho. You really don't have an option. You're forced contracted to pay the price that these independent physicians require. Thousands of Idahoans with median incomes between fifty and $60,000 a year being forced contracted to pay for services by physicians that aren't in network that are making three hundred dollars to $400,000 a year. Of course, not everybody loves the idea specifically those out-of-network physicians. So I know that we've had an incredible amount of pushback from physicians that don't contract with insurance providers. They are complaining that they will be forced contracted and are completely ignoring the fact that that's what they're doing to the average Idaho citizen. I mean, that, that's just what's happening. Is your average Idahoan doesn't have an option, those providers all have an option. House Bill 506, also known as the No Surprise Medical Bills, would allow out-of-network physicians to still treat patients. You go to an in-network facility um, and what happens is that provider who's out of network is reimbursed at the insurance rate for an in-network provider. So it's not as if they're not compensated for their services at all. Blanksma says at the end of the day, it's all about transparency. When you get your hospital bill, you should know that that's your bill. You should be able to pay your bill, hopefully, and then you shouldn't get a secondary bill from an entity that you didn't even know that you'd contracted with. And that bill is sitting in the Health and Welfare Committee and sometime next week is the hope when they do try to hear a little bit more about that. It's now one step closer. Testimony took it into the second day, but a bill that would keep transgender girls from playing on the girls team is now headed to the House for debate. There were last ditch efforts to hold the Fairness in Women's Sports Act in the House Affairs Committee, but those failed. The bill passed after a voice vote right along party lines. And we've gotten a lot of questions from viewers about this bill, like this one here from Nona. If my daughter was born male, she would have to play on the boys' sports team. So, she would then be required to use the boys' facilities, such as the locker rooms and showers? Well, that's not exactly covered in this bill, but we did ask that question of the Idaho High School's Activities Association. And for example, how is it handled if a girl were to play on the football team? We were told they don't have a policy in place when it comes to locker rooms and who uses which. Those decisions would be made by the school. As far as the question I asked yesterday of Representative Ehart, who's putting forth this bill, about who can question an athlete's gender and what that dispute process looks like, well, she's been in meetings all day and just got back to me about moments ago, and she says it would follow the same process they have now with any disputes. It would go through a coach, then the school, then the district, and so forth. And also that the Idaho High School Activities Association already has a medical form where a student athlete has to answer questions that are gender specific. I looked at those and they are there. So you're supposed to kind of answer those questions truthfully. So there should be no question as to who's playing on what team. I also asked her about the Alliance Defending Freedom and she said she did ask for their help in drafting this bill. We'll have more coming up about that in future shows. Representative Ehart has been busy this session, especially the last couple of days and going into tomorrow as well. In addition to sending along her transgender athlete bill, tomorrow she plans to reintroduce a bill from last year's session. And this one also has to do with sex. It would require parents to opt in for their students to be enrolled in sex education 
rather than opt out. Currently, all students receive sex education as part of the standard health curriculum unless parents sign a waiver to excuse their child. The opt-in bill passed the House last year but was killed in the Senate Education Committee. And it's understandable if parents want to have the talk with their kids on their own without any input from a teacher. The talk, by the way, includes contraception, at least it does in schools, and of course abstinence. But neither one of those topics may be included in your discussion at home. I guess the question is, are they, are parents having the talk? Because when you look at states that already have opt-in legislation, they may not be doing so well when it comes to teenage pregnancy. Mississippi, Indiana, Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina, and Utah are all opt-in states. And you can see right over here, or there I should say, how they rank right now according to the CDC. Idaho and our opt-out policy right now is 25th when it comes to teenage pregnancy. And I spoke with Representative Ehart about this, and she says if we go toward the opt-in policy, she's not worried about a jump in teenage pregnancy in Idaho. He fought in one of the bloodiest battles in American military history. He survived, but 75 years later, he returned to the South Pacific to pay his respects to those who didn't. This 130 year old underwent a six month makeover. The big reveal next. You have a comment, a question, or a complaint? Send them our way. Text us at 208 321 5614. We'll get to through. We'll read some of your comments coming up at the end of the show. Thank you for your service. Yesterday at the Warhawk Air Museum, on the 75th anniversary of the day the Battle of Iwo Jima began, Nyssa High School students got to meet and thank a World War II veteran and hero. His name is Ernie Ferguson, and he so wanted to join the fight in World War II, he tried to sign up for the Marine Corps at the age of 16. Well, they made him wait, but only about a year and a half. Ernie waited a lot longer than that, more than seven decades, to return to the place that it considered one of the bloodiest amphibious assaults in our military history. The Battle of Peleliu saw 40% of the Marines and soldiers either killed or injured. Ernie thought he'd seen enough of the place the month or so he spent there in 1944, but he was wrong. 
A lot has been said about the intrinsic value of a photograph, but sometimes a picture carries more weight than any amount of words. Our motto was in World War II, ours is not the reason why, ours is just to do or die. Sergeant Ernie Ferguson will be 96 years old this November. How you feeling? Feel good. But way back in 1942, in the middle of World War II, Ernie joined the Marines as soon as he turned 18. I liked the uniform <laughs> and I liked the spirit. He wanted to go where the action was, so they sent him 6,700 miles across the Pacific, where on September 15, 1944, the 1st Marine Division hit the shore of Peleliu, a tiny two by six mile link in the Palau Island chain. Peleliu was in the first wave. Ernie, part of Company B, 1st Battalion, 5th Regiment, remembers landing on Orange Beach, but his feelings, he didn't commit to memory. I don't recollect being scared. You must have, must have been, but you don't have time to be scared. He was supposed to head to the airstrip, the primary purpose of what is now seen as a questionable military acquisition. The Japanese were not going to give it up easily. I emptied my rifle, stepped back where I could reload, and the man behind me stepped up and machine gun caught him. Nearly 10,000 Americans were killed or injured in Operation Stalemate II. It was supposed to have been a three-day battle, and I was there for about a month. By day two, Ernie remembers reaching his objective. I was the first one to the airport. I felt kind of lonesome out there by myself, dodging machine gun bullets and crossing that airport. It was only after it was over that Ernie realized the cost of Peleliu, but it didn't diminish his determination to fight for his country. You know, I may get a little emotional sometimes bringing this back, but uh, we was either going to win or we wasn't coming back. Which brings us back to this picture, taken last month in Peleliu. That's Ernie, back on Orange Beach, for the first time since the last time. I wanted to do it. It was a dream come to, to be able to do that. Ernie says he wasn't exactly flooded with memories going back. For 75 years, I tried to forget. But those emotions that he neglected last time, this time, walking across that airstrip again, they weren't so easy to ignore. It was something else to realize that I moved awful slow this last time. First time I was there, I got to I was moving a little faster. And this time, instead of his brothers in arms, he brought along his son, Dan. I'll never forget it. I got to go back, walk the same sand at Orange Beach that Dad made the assault on. I got to go back, walk that same airstrip that they assaulted. I got to do that with my 95-year-old dad. Who gets to do that? Pictures can bring back a lot of memories, but sometimes actually going back can resurrect a lot more. To be able to pay my respects to those that didn't make it, that paid the extreme sacrifice, was a very humbling experience. I wouldn't take for that experience of going back the second time. I'd hate to have to live it again, but I wouldn't take for what they instilled in me. Once a Marine, always a Marine. 95 and still getting around pretty well. In fact, the hardest part of that trip for Ernie was the 24-hour flight to get there. And in spite of all his military experiences, Ernie said the toughest thing he's ever had to do was take his son to the bus station because Dan was going to be a helicopter pilot during Vietnam War. Well, that war ended nearly 50 years ago. The Vietnam one, that is. And it took that long for Vietnam veteran from Idaho Falls to receive full honors for his injuries. Former Idaho Army National Guard Sergeant Richard Linger was formally presented with the Purple Heart Medal. Linger served with the 116th Engineer Battalion in Vietnam as a combat engineer. In May 1969, he was operating a scoop loader when he ran over a landmine. The blast caused his ears to bleed and left a cut across his face. 
While he was still recovering in the hospital, he did receive the Purple Heart Medal, but he was never presented the award certificate in an official ceremony. Linger was also presented with the Vietnam Service Medal with four bronze service stars, the National Defense Medal and the Army Commendation Medal. Linger is one of more than 4,000 Idahoans who have been awarded a Purple Heart. Well, the tie comes off for the show, so here we are, right here, you know. We're, all I got to do is remember to put the tie back on at 6 o'clock. I mean, these guys who have one show, they have it easy. As you take a look outside here at Skycam 7, you can see we have blue skies. Hope you enjoyed the day because the temperatures actually warmed up a few degrees above that. Uh, what we had yesterday, we are right around 40 degrees. You see 45 degrees for the high temperature, 46 for Caldwell, 43 degrees for Mountain Home, and there's Twin Falls with 40 degrees. Uh, the high temperature in Stanley, though, was only 26. They were very cold this morning, nearly 20 degrees below zero again. So here's a look at the day for tomorrow. We've got another day where the temperatures are going to be up at least the mid 40s. I think we could even see a 46 or a 47 and then a 50 degree reading for Saturday and a 53 degree reading 53 I said, which would be coming up for Sunday. So winds are out of the southeast at 11 right now, 15 in Mountain Home. Look at the difference of what this does with the wind chill. Wind chills 38 in Boise, Mountain Home 34 at Twin Falls 28. So if you look at the wind chills for tomorrow, we didn't get above 40 degrees because of the wind chill. Uh, that is the wind chill did not, but tomorrow we do. OK, so it shows that these temperatures are starting to warm up late in there in the afternoon. We could have wind chills around 42, 43 instead of 37, 38. So for tomorrow, Twin Falls 44 degrees. Show shown with 39 degrees. As you look at Sun Valley, it's 39 degrees for the high. Let's move over here to McCall, where tomorrow should be up to about 36. You still have some cold morning lows, but we don't see the little dash beside it for a negative nine. I'm talking nine degrees above, which should feel just a little bit better. Now here in the valley, we're still in the 20s at tonight. I've been emphasizing the fact that we've got some cold mornings. If you've been up early, you've noticed it. But for tomorrow, we're 46 instead of 44, so these temperatures are coming up. Now, this is a look at our future cast just to show you that we've got the clear skies overnight. Those clear skies do continue throughout tomorrow and they continue into Saturday. Right now, the Sunday storm does not look like it's going to be much. In fact, here we go. Uh, I'm not forecasting much in the way of showers, maybe a little later in the day and very early on Monday. The storm is moving more to our north and it's going to weaken. And if you look at the temperatures, you're looking at highs right around 50 degrees. And look at this for next week. Next Thursday could get up to 55 degrees. It spent half a year in the shop. Now Idaho's most important document is on display after a pretty intense makeover. And this is not so Idaho. Why fish and game say they need your help. And need our help answering a lingering question you might have? Connect with us on social media or email. Use the hashtag the 208. You could also text us 208-321-5614.
Take a look at this. It's the Idaho State Constitution and it's back home where it belongs in Idaho after a little bit of a vacation in Utah. The original document created in 1890 was in need of a little lift here, a bit of a tuck there. So the skilled professionals at the University of Utah got to work. The 130 year old Constitution had a laundry list of issues, a few including the binding had failed. Most of the text block had fallen off the spine. An outdated lamination treatment had been used on the first two pages, causing the pages to bend a bit and overall tears appeared on pages throughout the entire book and the text, I should say. And after months of work, the Constitution now in great shape as a brand new cover made from Nigerian goat leather. How about this, though? Twenty five thousand dollars is what it cost to put it back to its original. I guess you can say almost original look all raised from donors, though. The original state constitution will be on display at the Idaho State Archives beginning next month, March 10th through April 11th. It'll then be stored in a secured climate controlled environment. All right, we're going to come back with more of the 208 right after this. We're going to get to some of your comments coming up at the end of the show. Stay with us like these. You may have noticed we're not too keen on covering crime here on the 208 common or otherwise, but this one isn't so common and every once in a while we have to call attention to something we consider not so Idaho. Idaho Fish and Game says a full grown golden eagle was found shot west of Oakley, which is southwest of Twin Falls, and this happened earlier this month. Not only is it a violation of state law and a federal crime it has been since 1940s bald and golden eagle protection act. It's kind of like murdering a mascot of freedom. If you have any idea who might have done this, you are asked to call Citizens Against Poaching or 
Get in touch with Idaho Department of Fish and Game and let them know what you know. All right, when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of your comments like these. All right, welcome back to the 2-8. This is the part of the show where we kind of read and answer some of the questions that you might have here during the show. This one sent in from uh, BW in McCall. Why don't they have transgender teams only? If you're a boy, you're a boy. If you're a girl, you're a girl. If you are a whatever, then why don't you, why don't they have a whatever team? You're the or. Well, see, that's not how that works, BW. It's not necessarily either or sometimes. It's kind of how they identify themselves, and that's how that works. But as we've said before, Idaho High School Activities Association has had zero instances of any transgender athletes in the state of Idaho, so there's really not enough out there to make a team. But if they do just want to play, all they're asking for is a place to play, and Representative Ehart's bill is kind of trying to put them into one spot, that if they were a girl at birth, or excuse me, a boy at birth, and they transition to a girl, they still have to play on the boys' team. So we'll have more on that as that bill progresses through the state house. Here's one. I was charged for an appointment in my regular clinic after hours. Didn't know the doctor was not in my network. Ended up appealing the bill, telling that I couldn't choose the doctor since it, we, it was after hours. And they weren't billed again. Some of that happens a lot where you can kind of uh, fight the charge that's on your bill and it sometimes works out in your favor. So you can rec we can recommend that, but sometimes what's happening right now with this surprise billing bill is uh, they just want to get rid of that altogether so you don't have to go through this kind of rigmarole just to kind of figure out who owes what to whom. Did you really mean 4,000 Idaho residents have received a Purple Heart? That is 4,000 Idahoans in all time 
and they don't necessarily have to live here now, whatever. But yeah, that's the number that we have been told. And we've kind of had that number for the last couple of years. First, Brian has a tie, optional tie policy on the 28. Now Rick has, I know, shocked all of us, didn't it? Yep, the news has reached new levels of anarchy, and I love it. Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, there's Rick. No tie wearing Rick over there. Anarchy, all right, we're good with that. Just mixing things up a bit. That's what we like to do. Awesome show today. Made me cry. I love all the two weights and won't turn the channel on you. Way to go, Rick. I assume you're meet meeting the tie on that one as well. So, yeah, we're trying to mix things up. And no tie for Rick. I can't believe it. The tie is just a huge part of this. I do love the story of Ernie. If you haven't seen it, haven't seen it, check it out on our YouTube channel.